because it doesn't matter how much how big your budget is or how much you market something if a product isn't good as soon as the community gets a hold of it it's gonna like undo all of your budget all right what's up everybody welcome back to to the trial and error podcast today we have zach uh with us he is going to be talking about just what motivation looks like for him in his line of work he's a videographer in texas so as they say everything's bigger in texas zach how tall are you oh man five nine and something five nine and some change okay all right so you know they're 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 kind of right there texas it's all brand new uh, <laughs> it's all part of the branding uh zach tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do uh so uh, my name is zach i am 27 years old i think 27 or 28 i am the ceo of a company called jzb media and uh what we do is like web development videography photography uh, brand strategy, but we really only work with clients on the strategic level. We don't, uh, I think there's two different, you know, types of companies in that field. There are like the commodity based people who will build what you ask. And then there's like the strategy based people that are like, well, why do you want to build it? You know what I mean? We're the, we're the second one. That's where we spend all of our time. Um, outside of that, I'm also the chief of strategy for a company called faith network. And what that is, is we basically provide web development, uh, app development, live streaming, um, pretty much web technologies as a whole, but specifically for churches and ministries. It's not always half and half of where I spend my time. Sometimes it's more with, with JZB Media. Sometimes it's more with Faith Network. It's just, it just depends on the needs of, of whatever company has the most need of me in that specific time. Just because I'm curious, what made you choose going the more strategic route rather than kind of like fulfilling all clients' needs and instead of more like addressing them? What made you decide the difference in that? Do you feel like that was more difficult to get off the ground because that was the approach? There's a bunch of reasons. So uh, one reason is because like I love work, but I'm also very self-aware that I love work. To the point where if I let myself go, I would get ambitious and ignore everything else but work. I am very ethical with all of my decisions. I would never work for somebody doing something I didn't support no matter how much they paid me. Because I, I, I really I really don't care. Like as long as I have a shelter over my head, food to eat, I, I don't. I don't really care about money too much. I more care about building things. I care about impact. I care about actually making a difference. I find it's, it makes work more pleasurable. I, like I enjoy it a lot more. You get to work with a whole different breed of people um, whenever you kind of take on that strategic route. It's like I, I, I posted this story the other day on my Instagram feed and like it got some so like so people got mad about it what i said in that was like hey if you are a professional and somebody hires you to do something and they want to do something that you don't think is right and you don't say anything about it then you're not a professional because mm. like because they're hiring you because you're a professional because you know more than they do in that specific subject them hiring you is them acknowledging that and yeah. whether like whether they directly ask you to or not, it's your job as a professional to say, like, no, I'm not making the navigation on your site purple when your brand strategy doesn't even have the color purple in it. Or like, I'm not going to add this Comic Sans text to the banner of your video. Like, number one, Comic Sans is a horrible font choice. And number two, that's not part of your brand strategy. We're not going to put that in there. Or like, I don't care how dark you want this frame. Like, <laughs> we're not going to pull a Game of Thrones where you can't see anything. You know what I mean? And like, <laughs> and like that's just not a good idea. We're not going to do that. That's not going to serve the purpose that you want it to serve, which yeah. ultimately like what what a lot of people don't get is if like my company creates a website or we do like video, like uh, video production or we do photography or like product photos, whatever we're doing, our work is our like business card. 
Yeah. Like we're not going to rely on a marketing director who goes home every day to see his family to tell everybody how great we did at what he hired us to do, you know, cause that, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> like yeah. the only, the only way that we're going to continue to get work is if number one, what we're making for people is high quality. And number two, if what we create for people actually serves its purpose, I wouldn't recommend client services for everybody. Cause it, it sucks sometimes. Like, even even with all these filters up to prevent the type of, of people that you work with, which is another thing I'll get into here in a second, even if you were to serve like 0.0001% of the people who are looking for creative services, you could still be a millionaire. <laughs> yeah. Like, like if you are worried about money, you could say no to one, at, like you could say no to nine out of 10 people that want to work with you. And you could still make a living. You could still support your family. You could still like support yourself and go on vacation and, you know, do stuff like that. A lot of people think, especially when they're new to starting a business or man, I even know people who have been in the business game for a long time. They say yes to everything. That's probably one of the biggest things that prevents people from actually branding. Right. Is like. Mm. Uh, uh, everybody thinks a brand is just your logo, but it's not. It's everything that you do and don't do. Like it's what people know you for doing and, and not doing. Like for example, if you have a client and they want you to do a bunch of work for them and you say, yeah, we'll do it. And they say, well, can we have a discount? Like if you say, like think of like video production, like if you have a $10,000 video shoot and somebody wants to come up and they want you to do it for 5,000, and you say, yeah, I'll discount it. And you think to yourself, like this client thinks I'm doing them a favor. They think I'm giving them a f like a 50% discount on a $10,000 product and they're going to respect me more. And then the next project I do, they're going to like pay me what I want. And that's just not the truth to them. What you just gave them is a $5,000 product. That's how they yeah. think of it now. They don't think of it as a 10,000 that you discounted. And I guarantee you, they talk to other people about that same project. And whenever they have $10,000 to just spend, they're gonna go back to the guy who said, no, like I'm not doing it for $5,000. They're not gonna come back to you who did it for five. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. Why do you think, why do you think people tend to go that route as far as like one, like just being like a client pleaser as far as, you know, they will take any job that comes but two, that they kind of go that route of, oh, well, if we give them a discount here, then it'll help in the long run. People, and this is a lot of people, they are obsessed with immediate gratification. Um, I think it's very difficult to build a, not wrong word. I think it's very, it takes a very long time to build a client base. Um, that respect you and that actually resembles your brand. And it's just like, it's kind of like a virus, right? Whether you think like, let's, let's tip. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just a good time to say that anyways. Maybe if, if, if depending on when the podcast gets released, the uh, COVID-19 is a big deal right now. So there's, it's a nice play in words we got going on here. Yeah. So think of, think of a virus and the way that I'm going to explain it is a virus can either be a good thing or a bad thing in this like analogy. But let's say you have this client and they, funny enough, they're going to be a higher percentage of the population. The higher percentage of client referrals that actually come to you are going to be this client. Like they're going to come to you. They're going to get your pricing sometimes even before they get your pricing and they are going to want a discount. And that discount means two things. It means uh, there's a little bit of entitlement there. They think they deserve more work from you than they are willing to pay for, which there's deep psychological reasoning as to why that is the case. Um, and then two, they don't value you. Um, they're not going to value you or your team. And that's going to become more and more prevalent as you begin to establish more and more communication with them. You're going to find that um, they disrespect your team, that they have more needs than the people who are paying you for your time fully. Um, you're, you're just going to find those things out like as you go. Like a virus, they are on, the only thing that the only type of people that they're going to bring to your company 
as far as referrals go or people just like them. Um, mm. That's just, I don't know why it works, but people are kind of attracted to other people who are like them and they hang out and they talk to each other. And so anybody that comes in the door from them, they're going to say like, Hey, you gave Susie a discount. Can you give me a discount? Like, I know, I know you gave her a discount. Come on, hook it up. And then it's going to just keep going, keep going. The other type of client also spreads the same way. It's just slower. <laughs> you know, you're going to have people, uh, that come down the line that actually value you, they're going to be a very smaller amount than the other group. But as long as you wait for those people, you're going to find like they have an expectation that they're going to pay me my rates. They know what my average pricing is. And any time that that client communicates with me, I know that they respect me and I'm going to jump on their project like right away. Or I can say like, hey, like team member one and two, go ahead and start working on this project. Like they're going to pay the company. And I know that because they're paying the company, I can pay y'all to work on their project. If I want to run a business, I have to make money. And like well, there's so many people that are saying yes to people, even when they're not paying them money. Yeah. And that's that's not really running a business. That's. Like, I don't know what that is. Growing your brand or growing your company slowly and only to, towards your target client base. And the reason why that's important is kind of what I touched on a second ago. Like, you have to run a business. You have to, you know, have clients that are willing to pay you your rates, like your value, your team's value, so that, like, you're not spending your time working on a project that is you know, $500 when you could spend your time working on a project that's $10,000. If all of your projects are upwards of 5,000 and somebody wants a $2,000 project out of you, it doesn't really make sense to allocate your time towards that project and produce the same amount of quality as you are for all these other people that are paying you your actual rate. Monetarily, it doesn't make sense. And then ethically, it doesn't make sense because that's not fair to your other clients. Yeah, no, for sure. Something I'm interested in knowing too, and I know this is like kind of off topic of what we talked about offline as far as where this conversation was going to go, but I'm just intrigued to hear your thoughts on this. How do you brand yourself to like acquire those clients? I would say I'm just very straightforward. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Like all of the clients that I have currently, um, they want to do things different. They want to do it better. They're tired of, of, uh, not growing, I guess you could say. Um, Mm -hmm. and that's really a lot of my passion is, is growth. Like I want to, I like to be able as, as like non pridefully as it can sound, as I can sound saying this, I like to be able to step into situations and introduce growth or the possibility for it. If I'm not doing that, or if I don't have the, the opportunity to do that, then there's no reason for me to be there. And I think that that extends to my family and my relationships and like, like every facet of my life, but business, it's especially prevalent. I just have the opportunity to sit down with people and say like, Hey, like if, if this is actually what you want to do, then like we can definitely work together if you trust me with this project. Like I spent the past eight months going to a new barber every single two weeks and saying, sitting in their bar, like sitting in the chair and getting my hair cut and just mentioning like, man, this place is awesome. Like I see y'all have shirts, like y'all should be like pushing those on social media. Y'all should be freaking making a, make a website, get your e-commerce products out there. Like take photos of them, put them online. That way people can buy them. Like start a blog, start a YouTube channel, like do all like, you know, just introducing more and more new ideas and saying like, you can do this, you can do that. Like, don't think that all you can do is come into work every day and cut hair. Like you can design t-shirts, you can, you can start to develop a brand. You can start to peddle that brand. You can make a YouTube channels. People can know you specifically. And then people are going to buy your shirts because they care about you, not because they care about haircuts, you know, like, Mm -hmm. um, there's just, I like to get people dreaming, but yeah, that's, that's really how I do it is I get people to see the big picture and the possibilities, even when they are where they're at, wherever that might be. They go from this place of not really being sure of themselves to be like, yeah, like I can do this. I just don't have like the. Like I built the foundation. I just don't have the technical knowledge or I just don't, I don't know how to take pictures or I don't know how to, you know, I don't know how to build a site in a way that's easy for people to just come in and get what they need and go. 
anytime I do business with someone, I'm very straight up by saying, this is an equal exchange. Like you're paying me for what I'm giving you. After I give you what you're paying me for, I don't owe you any more. And at the same token, you don't owe me anymore because you're already paying for everything that you're getting. You know, mm. um, there's never that like a business can get awkward sometimes like that where you feel like you owe them more or you feel or they feel they owe you more. And I never I never allow it to happen. So it's it's both of those things. What would you say as far as having a like for any business um having that social presence, have you seen that boost businesses that you've been able to help strategically set up? And what does that kind of look like? Yes and no. And this is also my fault. If there, if the answer is no, and I still went along with it, that's my fault. But anyways, great marketing will never really help a bad product. Um, Mm. And so the first part of that is making sure that whatever it is that I'm assisting with, is actually uh, like a good product or a good service or a good event or something that would actually make sense to market effectively because it doesn't matter how much how big your budget is or how much you market something if a product isn't good as soon as the community gets a hold of it it's gonna like undo all of your budget i promise um and so that's the first part but for the products or the companies that have been like good places or good like all around good things to, for a consumer to want. Um, all of them pretty much have improved, not overnight, obviously over the course of a couple months. Um, digital strategy is not something that's just like immediate. Uh, sometimes people go viral and that's awesome for them, but that's just not like a realistic expectation for like a, an actual campaign or a marketing campaign. Um, But as soon as you establish this presence of, hey, number one, here's my brand. This is uh, both graphically and like uh, philosophically who we are like and we're going to stick to that. Now we can worry about everything else. But whenever you worry about like your foundation and you get that strong and you stick to it. Now, like if you create a website, it's a billboard. If you create T-shirts, they're billboards. If you um, anything that you do now, because you have this consistency, now everybody is knowing about you in all of those different ways. Like it's essentially being everywhere. If if that Mm. makes sense, it's 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 where your eyes are. There's so many just like brick and mortar companies right now that have the potential to be million dollar e-commerce companies you know like there's i think in my town alone there are like four or five mom and pop uh clothing boutiques where they get high traffic on like the main strip of town like tourists and town spoke and stuff like that they all walk and down they all walk up and down that road and they get good business um the rent in those buildings are upwards of like three to six thousand dollars a month and they can pay that easily and still pay all their employees and you know make a living out of it but they also have the opportunities to say like hey now we're gonna get you know all of our products professionally photographed we're gonna get them online and now our traffic is no longer limited to the 50 mile radius around our store now we can go on social media, we can be like effective there, we can be consistent there, develop a community there just like we have here in town. And now like our profits are no longer like dependent on the people that can actually come to our store. Um, mm. And you know, there are so many different ways to, to market something too. Like you don't have to talk about your product to market your product. Black Rifle Coffee is a good example of that. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love those guys. You buy your coffee because you like them. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? You, you don't buy it just specifically because of the coffee. You, you you support them as both creators, as veterans, as individuals. They're funny. You know, like there's tons of different reasons why you would like them. And like that's why you buy their products. That's why their name is in your head. That's why you started laughing when I said, yeah. yeah. No, a hundred percent. That's, that is, that is proof that it absolutely works to do it the way you're talking about, because there are a few, very few, uh, like 
you know, privately owned coffee companies that are as well known as they are. And it's just because of the way they've branded themselves, um, not only where they are in Texas, but they've also like branded themselves online in such a way that like, I mean, I don't think I know of a single person who doesn't know who they are. The way they went about it just you know, brought that to a whole other level where they're so well known now. And it wasn't, you know, because, you know, they got a contract with a store and the store just put it in there and they were like, all right, well, we'll sell your product for a few months and see how it does. Like, obviously that goes on too. But like the reason they got so popular is because of their online presence. Um, So something I kind of want to go into a little bit Um, with you personally then is since we got connected probably about three years ago, I've noticed you've had like a very consistent like online presence as far as like how often you post, but then also like the branding that you make um, for your posting, whether that be like through your Instagram grid or on Facebook or whatever, you're uh, you're pretty consistent in that. At what point did you decide to start going down that path where you were going to brand yourself? I think if I were to just let myself naturally become whatever it is that I was supposed to, uh, or like, I, I, I always think of like, well, what's the best I could become and what's the worst I could become. And mm-hmm. I always think like, if I just let myself do whatever, then I'm going to go be my worst. But if I like yeah. keep myself in check in certain areas, um, then I'm not gonna, I'm like, I'm not going to be that bad. <laughs> like I might still be like, <laughs> I might still be bad, but I'm not going to be that bad. You know, this is me personally. I enjoy being admired. Like I like to, I like to discuss things. I like to talk about things um, to the point where if I allowed it to, just that would drive my decisions. And mm. so because of that, I was like, I'm, I'm not using social media for like, personal use. I'm not going to adjust the way that I do things specifically for other people. I'm not going to follow like the, the trends or the memes or the things that everybody else is talking about to make myself relevant to the point where people want to like pay attention. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so with that, a lot of my like social media stuff, I love being creative uh, and I love getting people to think deeper. Uh, like if you go look at my Instagram, it, it's a, uh, it's at J Z B Zach. Um, and basically like if you go to most of the posts, it's going to be like some deep, like philosophical thing to like make you think about life or make you think about something that you're going through or a different way to handle what you're going through. Um, Stuff like that, I, I basically want to be different in that regard. I don't want to pretend everything's happy. I don't want to. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't use social media as a trend. I use it to basically stand out in um, ways to help people like get through mental things or just think different. And mm-hmm. kind of like what we were talking about earlier with like Black Rifle. Um, you don't need to talk about your product to sell your product. Uh, I get a lot of referrals to my website from my person or from my Instagram account. And it's just because like, Hey man, like I saw like how you, uh, posted about relationships. Like, like I think like that let's work together or like, Oh yeah, that, that was a really interesting post about pride. Let's, uh, let's work together. (laughs) You know, like it's, it's super weird. Like, Oh, I have this flower shop or I have this clothing brand and, and I like to work with someone who thinks like you. And like, those are the type of people I want to work with. I don't want to work with just like some random business who has it like, you know, all of their work on their Instagram page. Like Mm -hmm. I want to, I know that you as the individual run this company and that's why I want to work with it. You know, thoughts just not as prevalent as it used to be like strong critical thinking, self-awareness, that, that stuff is just not around like it was when I was six or seven years old and my parents were raising me like that. That's just not there anymore. And so whenever you see that out in the world, like me personally, when I see someone who's real and who's like, you know, who posts about like, hey, like uh, my wife and I were having this issue. This is how we handle it. 
like we both had a lot of pride. We both like were making decisions based off of the wrong reasons. Here's how we fixed it. Like, I'm like, man, like I'm going to pay attention to the stuff that you say from now on, because like you abandoned, you know, things that make us feel great to tell us what we actually needed to hear to tell us something that is actually going to help us. And you didn't have to make your life sound perfect to do it. What importance do you see in branding yourself, uh, whether that's on social media or, you know, however you want to figure that out? Well, how do you see that importance in the time we're in right now? We're like globally kind of at a standstill. Man, I think it, it's like a wake up call for a lot of people, both the business sector and the church sector, like are like, oh man, what are we going to do? Like for, I've gotten to work with like a couple different clients uh, these past like few weeks who have just been like, hey, uh, remember that thing we talked about like a couple months ago and we told you we were going to hold off? We're ready. (laughs) Like, because like so many people are starting to realize if I had an online presence already, like if I were to have like my brand established, all my social media channels paid attention to and like my online store, my website up and going, we like if all of that stuff would have been done before this pandemic, like caused me to basically say like no business, I could still be getting paid. I could still be paying my employees. Like if I would have put my time and effort into that before this wouldn't be as bad (laughs) and people are just finally realizing how important it is to be everywhere especially now where you can't um, walk outside to to go and talk to somebody about your business they have to know you already you know like they you have to be on their mind it's Mm -hmm. it's more it's more than just uh posting something online it's posting something that's high quality that somebody might need. And even if they don't need it right when they see it, they're going to think of you whenever they do want it because they don't want to limit their talent to the people who live close to them. Like it's the same thing with an online presence for a business. You don't want to limit your potential profit to just people that live around you whenever you, it could be the whole world, you know? Mm -hmm. And even if 0.001% of the United States buys your product, you're a millionaire. So it's like, like it sounds nonchalant, but it's true. It just takes like hard work and effort just for like a short amount of time. And when I say short amount of time, I mean like one to three years. If you're yeah. consistent, if you're consistent on social media for one to three years, you're Peter McKinnon, you're Casey Neistat, you're like, you know, you're people who stuck to a consistent schedule for an extended amount of time. And now you're in everybody's minds. Now everybody knows who you are. And, you know, that's, the first step of business. Now you can release any type of product. Everybody immediately knows about it. And if you have a million subscribers on YouTube and 1% buy your product, you made 10 grand. It's more important than ever. And then on the church side of things, I think uh, we've set up like 20 or 30 different live stream contracts over the past, since all this started like a month ago. Yeah. Uh, and it, and you know, we were staying up till four or five in the morning to keep up with the demand of the churches that wanted to do this. And we don't like use a third party provider. We set up like, um, well, we use like Amazon CDN servers and, uh, we handle all that stuff. So it's a good platform, but we were staying up all night, just building all of like the integrations and, and setting up all of the services that were needed for each of these individual churches to get off the ground and stream that Sunday, like, four days before they contacted us, you know? Um, but it's just there, everybody really is, is everybody right now is, is just nervous. They're afraid they're uncertain, but I think those are like really great feelings to have. Mm -hmm. Cause, cause like they can make you do some, some like risky stuff that you needed to do either way. How has this affected your strategy and how will that, how do you see that carrying over until after this passes? It's affected my strategy. Um, more so like I, I care more about things like, um, e-commerce than I did before. Um, before, like if somebody said, Hey, I have, uh, 
X amount of dollars to spend, you know, what, what should we do? I would say, Oh, well, uh, let's send photographers to your shop. You know, let's, let's take photos. Let's have them there weekly so that we can be posting every single day of the week. Let's keep it consistent online. Let's put the majority of our budget there. Maybe we'll allocate 30% of your budget to running social media ads. Um, and like, let's do that for right now and see what happens. Whereas now I, I'm a lot more focused on, making whatever business that is talking to me into a digital, like a digital brand rather than like a brick and mortar brand as best as I can. Like with this, uh, this barbershop that I'm working with, we're in the process of, of designing like t-shirts for them, uh, that we're eventually going to put all on their e-commerce site, t-shirts, um, packaging for, for like their existing like beard oils and stuff like that, handling the logistics of actually getting them printed, embroidered, uh, and then putting those online so that people can come and, and purchase them. Number one, as a means of uh, revenue for that company, but number two, they're gonna now have a billboard on their shirt that they're gonna be walking around in public with, which is gonna help grow the community, grow the social media channels, Secondary to that, like even with this like COVID stuff, I'm working on an appointment system for them because I don't know if you saw, but Texas basically announced that is like the businesses are going to start reopening, but social distancing still needs to occur. And the appointment blocks are spread out based on the positioning of the actual chairs so that no two barbers next to each other are cutting hair at the same time but like they can also have appointments scheduled and like allocated to them. So like eventually, whereas this, this, uh, barbershop is closed right now, it's going to be able to reopen soon and like have appointments online that people can actually pay for before they show up and then walk in, get their haircut, leave. And it's like their business is no longer going to be based on like, if somebody like wants to walk in the door and see how long they have to wait, it's gonna like, they're actually making money in a physical location um, before anybody gets there all because of their presence online. On the internet right now, like that's like a huge thing. Like people are like, you know, when am I going to be able to go get my haircut or people are trying to cut their own hair or whatever. It's like, this is, this is a great example of like in this time, rather than like sit around and just wait for, you know, being able to reopen your business. Instead, you're taking advantage of that time to make it better. So when this all passes over, they're able to reopen. People already have their appointments scheduled. They're already coming in. And like, you know, that's that's really where they're going to have like their economic boost is because they took advantage of this time um, when they're not able to be open and they were still able to invest into the business and do things that, you know, especially right now, there's like so many times where companies and different people they feel like they can't do anything because they're too busy and now they've been given a reason to just completely stop and it's up to you like are you going to accomplish those things or not and in this case you know they're taking full advantage of this time to grow their business you know for the future so as soon as this all is over you know they turn the lights back on and then they're just immediately getting business, more business than what they were getting before the pandemic happened. And I think they'll probably see that their funds kind of come back from that. Um, so, Zach, through all this, uh, what what keeps you motivated as both a creative but also as a strategist, just as you're um, pitching all these plans and coming up with these and, you know, you're staying up? all hours of the night, you know, growing your own business, but also helping everybody grow theirs. Um, how do you stay motivated in that? Because I know um, for me personally, and for a lot of other business owners that I know, they all get burned out in the monotony of it and, you know, kind of end up with a, well, it's what the client wants. And then they just keep, you know, that just becomes, you know, who they are and what their business is. How do you stay out of that? And how do you stay highly motivated for what you're doing? That, that's a big reason too, man, why I don't want to work with people who look at me as a commodity, like someone that's easily replaceable or like, uh, so I'm going to read this thing, man. Have you, um, I read a book like three years ago at the four years ago, five years ago at the, uh, recommendation of one of my good friends. So 
uh, the last actual like job job that I had, I uh, worked for Apple, and one of the one of the guys that I worked with in Apple, super insane productive guy, always felt like doing his work. Um, like it's just weird, you know. Sometimes you meet people and they're like, "Man, how do you?" How, how, like, <laughs> like you're just, yeah. you're just fine coming into work and sitting down and paying attention to what you're supposed to pay attention to. And then you leave and you got everything done. <laughs> like, um, but anyways, he recommended this book to me. It's called deep work. Uh, I don't have the author, um, on hand. I can find that, but there's a difference here between deep work and shallow work. So deep work, their activities performed in a state of distraction, free concentration that push your cognitive abilities to their limit. These efforts create new value, improve your skill and are difficult to replicate. Um, so that means like people who work di- deeply, they're not going to be matched like easily. So if you do get someone instead of them, they're going to be someone who works just as deeply. And that means they're going to have a very similar process than you. Um, and then there's shallow work, which is non cognitively demanding logistical style tasks often performed while distracted. These efforts tend to not create much new value in the world and are easy to replicate. Not to sound bad towards these people, but like developers, some people who just code, um, they'll say, Hey, give me the design. I'll make it, you know, like, there there's not much in that like most people aren't going to know the difference between clean code or dirty code you know like if something could be coded with less lines the client's not going to know that and so like there there is no reason why they would choose that coder rather than some other coder to make the same in product you know so that's that's why it's like easily like that guy watched netflix while he built your website you know what i mean (laughs) it's like (laughs) It's a, that's the first part of it is I want to make sure that I'm working deeply and that's when I really enjoy what I'm doing. Um, and I also know that it's not going to be, it's not going to be easy to replace me like that. Like people are coming to me for a very specific reason, um, because they already know what I do and what I don't do and how I work. And that's why they come to me, um, versus like why they would go to somebody else, you know? sometimes work does get like depressing and monotonous and like, I don't want to do it, but I think that's one of the cool things about having other people that depend on you. Uh, like that's like a plus, I guess, like you could say is like, I, if I don't do this, it's not just me getting derailed. It's like whatever stability that accomplishing this next task provides would be taken away from the people that depend on me. And so it's like, I'm going to do this. Like, yes, I love my job, but it does get stupid sometimes. Um, But even when it gets stupid, I'm still going to perform because there's still people that are depending on me to perform, you know? Uh, And whenever it gets difficult and monotonous and I don't feel like doing it, like I can think about them and get through it. And then it's fine again. It's uh, I think if we only think about us, it's easy to quit. Um, it's much more difficult when you realize everything that could fall. If you do that, it is what I love to do also. Like I love just being creative and stuff like that. Uh, this quarantine has really showed me that, uh, I need to focus more on creativity and less about, uh, money, I guess you could say (laughs) like, yeah, uh, it's just, it's just been fun to have the extra time to, you know, just tell my girlfriend like, Hey, let's go and let's go shoot. Let's go shoot some photos. Like let's go do the thing that assisted our relationship starting in the first place that we haven't done in forever. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? And so, yeah, it's it's been a lot of that. I've I've realized that, uh, creativity and hanging out with my other friends who are also creative is something that was a lot more important to me being right here where I am then I realized initially like this business wouldn't exist. I don't think. No, that's super awesome. Um, well, that's all we have time for today. Zach, thank you uh, so much for being on. And uh, do you want to do one more social media plug? Uh, sure. I, uh, Instagram is probably the, the best place to reach me. If uh, anybody wants to see my stuff or talk to me uh, and that's uh, just at JZB Zach. And my uh, website is just jzbmedia.com. 
Well, Zach, thank you so much for being on the Trial and Error podcast today. Uh, A lot of great insight from you. I know I learned a lot um, and heard a lot of great things, and I hope uh, that everybody else definitely got uh, some golden nuggets out of out of that interview because I I know that that will I will be sitting on this conversation for a, for a hot minute. <laughs> but I've been Caleb Chamberlain with the Trial and Error podcast. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.